Hey, Dr. Cindy here with Essential Therapies Podcast. And today we have a throwback to 2020 with an interview I did with John F. Barnes, the father of myofascial release. And you know, I feel like now this information is more relevant than ever. And although there's more awareness, I think now of the fascia three years later out in the world today, I still don't feel like there's enough awareness about the John F. Barnes myofascial release approach. And yes, it is something different. I oftentimes have patients tell me, hey, I went somewhere and visited and had somebody do myofascial release, but they weren't doing what you do. So I think this is really relevant and I hope you enjoy this replay with John Barnes. Enjoy. Yes, there we are. I just confirmed that we are here. Dr. Cindy Hodgson here. I'm a physical therapist and exercise physiologist, owner of Essential Therapies here in Toledo, Ohio. But most importantly, I am a John F. Barnes myofascial release practitioner. And it is just, I am so honored today to be bringing you the John Barnes himself. There he is, um, who I truly think of as the father of myofascial release. And, you know, even now today in 2020, you can find his name in, in massage textbooks um, and all over uh, the place when you hear about fascia. He's been treating patients from around the world since 1960 and teaching seminars on this approach since 1973. So way before fascia was a thing, like now people talk about fascia like, like it's the new thing, but John's been doing this for, for decades and he owns treatment centers in Malvern, Pennsylvania called The Sanctuary and in Sedona, Arizona, where he is today at Therapy on the Rocks. Um, he's trained well over 100,000 therapists with his approach by now and he contributes regularly to the Massage Magazine, and I would really encourage you guys to check that out. If you go to his website, which is myofascialrelease.com, if you look on the tab that says myofascial release, you'll see his name, and you can click on there and see his, his CV, which talks all about the things that he's done and all of the, the presentations that he's given and papers and articles he's written and you can actually click on there and pull a lot of this information up so that's really a golden nugget to have there on his website so he's been a featured speaker on many platforms over the years talking to neurosurgeons orthopedic surgeons a psychiatrist therapist tmj specialist the list goes on and on and he He's still treating patients and teaching regularly at seminars this year. It's been a little bit rough for all of us as myofascial release therapists. We love going to your courses, John, and just repeating them and being in your presence and learning more from you all the time. And it's it's so I'm I'm really excited to be able to have this time with you. I know everyone else is to hear your voice and and see you and and just just kind of be in be in your presence. So thank you so much for joining us here today, John. Okay. Really good to be with you. Hello, everybody. I've known Cindy for 20 years now, so you're looking great. Thank you. You too. You too. So I just want to check here and make sure that everything's going right on, on Facebook. So let me just peek. Yep, we are, we are good. So we have um, transferred over to where we, where we need to be. And this will also be on YouTube for, for those of you watching who want to be able to share it with those who are not on this social media platform. So John, I, I wonder if, for, if, if you could tell us, um, for those who are watching who don't know who you are and just what myofascial release even is, if you could share with them about your journey and your story of how you began developing this myofascial release approach and, and what do you want us to know about, about this approach? Well, I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania back in 1960, before YouTube was around. <laughs> phones are still hanging on a wall somewhere. And <laughs> a long time ago. Um, and I uh, graduated a physical therapist. I've since become a massage therapist also. Mm -hmm. And um, I had been an athlete when I was younger. And I played football. And I ran track. I skied and I swam, I drove motorcycles and uh, got involved in competitive weightlifting, competitive karate. Basically, I love motion and I love competition. And one day I went down to work out and there was nobody in the gym. And I was doing squats with somewhere over 300 pounds. 
and I got to the point where I couldn't get up. I had nobody to help me. So I'd been a gymnast when I was younger. So I thought I'd just do a back roll. But when you have a 300 pound bar in your hands, your hands don't let go. So I crashed into the ground with tremendous force and I ruptured the disc at L5, that's lower back area. I ripped a lot of ligaments and I laid there totally stunned. And I felt numb from the waist down. Now, before I go on, this was my first experience and one of the primary things I teach today that when I'll get, and I'll come, and let me come back into the survival mechanism we have. So that survival mechanism mine kicked in. Basically, the, it numbed me out to help me get through the ordeal and the intense pain. I couldn't move my legs. And then the numbness started to wear off and then the pain began and it was really horrible. And I had to crawl out of the gym. I laugh at it now, but it was horrible. You know? And in that instant, the things that I loved the most were taken from me. Motion, competition, and so life became quite a struggle. And I tried every form of therapy known to mankind and uh, nothing helped, most temporary results. And so up to that point, I thought that therapy worked and I found out that nobody wanted to get better more than I did. So uh, a friend of mine was a radiologist and he invited me up to a ski house one weekend and he could see how much pain I was in. So he suggested I see an orthopedic surgeon to get a spinal fusion. So I went and I got, I, uh, got the, the, the surgery and he, they gave me a fusion instead of a laminectomy because I was an athlete. And I'll never forget, after the surgery, the doctor walks in and then talks to me a little bit. And as he's walking out, he says, and by the way, don't ever flex or extend your spine again. How the hell? He never told me that beforehand. So anyway, the fusion did help. But I was still in a lot of pain. I still couldn't really move that well. So out of total desperation, really, he, I started to treat myself and I would do that on the living room floor. And uh, it was, so it was my low back area. So living, laying on the living room floor, I started to push into that area, but I was still very strong and I was trying to bull my way through. And over time, I learned to be more gentle. Then over time, I learned if I waited longer that I was starting to get a dramatic turnaround in my pain and my ability to move again. As I treated myself, I was having these strange sensations. They were far away from the origin insertion of muscle the way I was trained and around me. And I started to realize that maybe what I was dealing with was the fascial system, but I hadn't had much training in school. So at that point, I had been asked to lecture to TMJ specialists at the osteopathic college. So I had access to the library. So I went to the library and I found a stack of information on the fascia about that thick. On top of that stack of information was a pile of dust about that thick. Hadn't been touched in decades. So uh, Dr. Andrew Still, who's the founder of osteopathy, had some really good insights into the fascia system. But I think he was saddled with uh, the old osteopathic form of myofascial release. And the other forms of myofascial release you may have heard about uh, basically were just too quick and too forcible. The old form of myofascial release, which we can go back and talk about in more detail in a little bit, is an attempt to force the system that can't be forced. So unlike other forms of therapy or like other forms of therapy, it only produces temporary results. So I just found that as I, again, became even more gentle and even more patient, uh, I began to make a wonderful turnaround. And I started to apply this to my patients and I had incredible results. That was sort of how things got started. Mm -hmm. Now, if we get into unwinding, I'm not sure if you want to go there or not, but later remind me, there's another part of that story we can get back into. Okay. So at the time you were uh, working in outpatient and, and uh, beginning to use this with your patients at that time, and about how much time would you spend with them? Just curious looking back. Full treatment session? Yeah. Like when you first started playing around with this idea. 
Well, back in those days, uh, the treatment sessions were about 15 minutes. Then they went up to about a half an hour, and then now now they're close to an hour for most sessions, mm -hmm. 45 minutes to an hour. The fascial system, uh, when it's restricted, uh, let me just back up a bit. M almost all of healthcare is based on symptoms, but symptoms are only the tip of the iceberg. The symptoms are effects. They're not the real problem. So you'll find that as you start to get treated, you'll need more time for a while because a lot of the traumas in your life, even though you thought maybe they were taken care of, have been laying there idle. And then over time, more and more trauma, major traumas, micro traumas, there's a tipping point. And all of a sudden you start to have all these symptoms and it gets worse rapidly for many people. The other very important thing to understand is that uh, fascia restrictions do not show up in any of the standard testing being done. So it's been missed. And no physician or therapist has been adequately trained in the fascial system to recently. Right. So give yourself time, give yourself, be patient because you're going to uncover a lot of stuff that's been there for a long time. So, mm -hmm. so that reminds me, I wanted to bring up this book here. So this is um, John's second book that, that he wrote. We talk about some of the stories, your stories in here and many other stories of other patients and, and really explains a lot of, of what you're talking about. So if there's anything you'd like to point out about this, I'd love to, to bring some attention to that. But also I wanna show this book because this book, um, I had the fortune in PT school to be introduced to, to you. Um, my instructor showed your video, your one hour video of introducing the fascial system, which is quite old now. But when I first saw it, it was, it really resonated with me and it really perked my ears up. And then it, my first clinical experience uh, which was at the end of all of our education, I just so happened to have a clinical instructor who had just gotten back the night before from your MFR1 class. And she had this book and she was all excited. And I, I couldn't believe it because I knew that I wanted to do this work. So here she was, as the universe would have it, set me up in this situation where I had six or eight weeks, I guess it was, to work. And, and she gave me this book and said, you can, do, you can study this and do whatever you want with these patients and spend as much time as you like. So I had some amazing stories happen. So I, I wanted to show this because this book has you know, specific um, techniques and education in it, which is just a fantastic manual. Okay. And so for the first few years, I was using this book and for about 15 minutes on patients, because that's all we had time for in clinic back then, you had you know so many patients at the same time and you know, you'd look lucky if you had 15 minutes, but I was getting results with only 15 minutes hands-on using using these technique, techniques. I'm sure I was making a lot of mistakes using too much pressure and, and that sort of thing. But I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what makes this approach different. So you talked about if, at first you were pushing too hard into your system. And, and so a little bit about why is your approach different than all these other body work um, options out there? And maybe a little bit about the time as well. Yeah, the, uh, all of, there's a lot of, um, you know, things become successful, a lot of copycat courses show up. Mm -hmm. So there's been other forms of deep tissue release. Uh, they come under many different names, but they're really variations on the same theme. As I said a little earlier, it's an attempt to force the system that can't be forced. So we use a little bit of that ourselves, and that mechanically breaks up the crosslinks that develop when trauma occurs. But what has been missed, and it's, this is huge, is treatment of the water that lies within the fascia. It's called the ground substance. All of research that's been done on the fascial system has been done on dead people. Dead people are brittle, and dead people don't have consciousness. And that's the model of reality we as therapists and physicians learned. Basically, we learned about dead people without consciousness or a fascial system and paid no attention to the fluidity of our body. So that as we go through trauma, the vector of energy that's thrust into us, whether it's by hit by a car, childbirth, falling down steps, whatever it is, that changes the viscosity of the ground substance, which should be fluid and allow the tissue to glide. As it becomes more and more viscous, it eventually creates crushing pressure on pain sensitive structures, nerves, blood vessels, joints, et cetera, and creates the symptoms we have pain, headaches, fibromyalgia, which we talk about that a little bit if you want to. And uh, 
so since it doesn't show up in all the standard testing, uh, it's been totally missed for eons now. So, um, but we see the human being as far more than just a physical structure. We treat the physical structure and that's our initial angle. But the reason for the time factor is it allows for a number of phenomena to occur that don't occur in other therapies. And these phenomena, which I'll get into in a moment, are absolutely essential for true healing to occur. So we, the order of myofascial release is to feel the restriction in that person's body. Everybody has a different pattern in their body. So as therapists, we learn protocols, one size fits all. But that's a big problem because it has nothing to do with the person lying on the treatment table. Mm -hmm. so this is truly individualized care. So there's over 7 billion people in our, on our earth and there's over 7 billion different passable fascia strain patterns. So the art is for the therapist to be able to feel where that restriction is, feel when it releases, and go to the next layer and next layer as time goes on. So there's a whole art to this. Mm -hmm. When I was in physical therapy school, the first day they talked about the science and art of physical therapy. I never heard the word art after that, ever again. So we've lost the bigger picture, so to speak. You know? So the therapist will assess your body by touching you, it's a glide system so that we get, get a sense of where the glide is. We visually analyze, we tactically analyze you. We use something beyond our tactile senses called the proprioceptive senses too. And we feel where your restrictions may be. And the therapists I've trained have spent a lot of time in becoming a true therapeutic artist. So when we find that restriction, we never force it. That's therefore we never injure anybody. Mm -hmm. But we gently nudge into the restriction and then we wait. And we wait and we wait. Somewhere around 90 to 120 seconds, we finally begin to engage what's called the collagenous barrier. And then another three to five minutes is usually necessary to totally release, or not totally anyway, but to begin to release the ground substance to fluidity within the fascial system that has hardened. It turns into crushing pressure. So Somewhere around the five minute period or so, sometimes a little bit longer, there's a number of phenomena that occur. The first is piezoelectricity. Piezoelectricity is a Greek word for pressure electricity. It's a well-known fact that these cells of our body have a crystalline nature. And you know, if you put pressure into a crystal, it generates electricity. When our body, it's a bioelectrical phenomenon that occurs. So piezoelectricity begins to create an energetic response at the cellular level. That is usually coupled with something called mechanotransduction. So in other words, our physical pressure also converts things into a electromagnetic effect all the way down to the cellular level. It's recent research has just shown, and this is very important, that when myofascial release is performed for a sufficient amount of time, the patient's mind-body begins to produce interleukin-8, which is our body's natural anti-inflammatory. It also produces interleukin-3 and 1b, which have to do with increasing circulation and boosting the immune system, which are absolutely important for healing. It's also a lot of research is now showing that a lot of diseases come from a thwarted inflammatory response. So my fascia release can help you on some very profound levels when it's done properly, and I emphasize done properly. Mm -hmm. Then we eventually move into phase transition. You and I were brought up to believe that there were three phases of water, water, ice, and vapor. Now, the work of Dr. Gerald Pollack, who's one of the leading experts in fluid dynamics, he has found a fourth phase. And that fourth phase is basically liquid crystal. Another word for liquid crystal is fascia. A lot of my critics uh, have for years said, well, if what you say is true, science would have to be wrong. Oh my God. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. Science is so wrong. Person. So one of the things also that 
typical traditional therapy doesn't like is chaos. Everything in medicine and therapy is supposed to be orderly and controlled. That would be fine if it worked. It's not working. Too much temporary results from traditional therapy. So when you go into phase transition, it enters a chaotic period. And if you understand systems theory, you may want to look up systems theory and chaos theory, because it has a lot to do with myofascial release. System theory basically says we have to go into a chaotic period for any possibility of growth, change, and healing. And then because we have a mind, your mind always then will reorganize yourself at a higher level. So there's this roller coaster ride that we take with my fascia release. Then finally, we go into what is called resonance. When the therapist touches your body, your vibratory level and the therapist's vibratory level is quite different. But here again, it comes to value of sustaining pressure for a while. There will be a point between the two of you when the vibratory levels completely match identically. And that's when the energy that has been trapped in the system from trauma starts to move through you and eventually out. Another word for resonance is release. So that's what we're after. And it takes a little time. And the therapist I train, it drives them nuts for his visit or two. Because our whole society, basically, they can't be still, they can't be quiet. I can't wait to get on to the next thing. I think you were going to ask me eventually too about channel three and channel five. So if that ties into that, we can come back to that in more detail. Yeah. That's great. I never tire of hearing of all of those phases and just how that has not really been honored in traditional therapy, like you say. Um, it reminds me too of these. You know, for patients that I see, and I wrote this, I just want to see exactly how I, for, just, for patients just starting their myofascial release journey. So like you said, at first it kind of drives them crazy, this waiting and, and whatnot, this, you know, this pattern of wanting to make things hurry up. What would you say is most important for new patients to understand in, in regards to that right there, the, the idea of being patient, but then also that kind of ties into what we recommend as therapists, I, I have a hard time on occasion in educating patients about this work in that, you know, these, these restrictions didn't happen overnight most of the time. I mean, yeah, we might have an accident, but usually that accident is layer upon layer from years gone previous. And so, you know, we'll have a, a treatment or two. And so a lot of times people are discouraged that they're not having this incredible healing event in one or two treatments. And how would you, educate them, a, a new patient on this journey, um, what is the best thing for them to hear from you? Well, one of the things I suggest for all therapists is the first visit or two, but because my fast release is also an educational process because it's totally different than most of the things we learn. Mm -hmm. In fact, everything we learned, as you know, was logical and linear. And we applied those principles to a nonlinear body that is not logical, complete craziness. Yeah. So. <laughs> So the thing I'll say to the patient is that, number one, I'll never injure you. You have total control. All you ever have to do is ask me to ease up or hold, and I will. And as therapists, they must always honor that so the patient can trust the therapist. Too many therapists haven't listened to their patients. You can use any words you want as long as they're understandable and mutually agreeable. So I go on to say that sometimes when you're uh, feeling myofascial release in your body, it may hurt, but because I'm not forcing, I'm not injuring you. But that's really important because most people relate pain to injury. So that the key to healing is feeling. So if pain's coming up, you want to feel the pain. Again, you can stop anytime you need to. But most people stay with it because something about it feels really right. Something their body has needed for so long. So I explained to patients that um, if you're talking or thinking, or bracing against what you're feeling, there's no therapeutic value. And that unfortunately describes most therapeutic sessions. Too much idle chatter. This comes back to the channel five thing, but we'll get there. So that the, is a delicate interplay between the therapist and the patient. And we're always feeling the body's response, the body language, the tone of the voice. And so that as you're treating somebody, if you notice they're tightening against what you're doing, and you just gently suggest they soften into it. If they can and they ask you to ease up, you always ease up. But then you educate them again. 
This is called therapeutic pain. If you go to my website, go to the article section, there's an article I've written called Therapeutic Pain, which I recommend you all read. You're welcome to print it out to give to your patients and clients also. Also, there's an article I've written called My Fascia Release, The Missing Link. And that's a good generic article that goes over for your patients how it doesn't show up in all the standard testing, a lot of the aspects we'll be talking about. So um, you have to be patient with some, you have to be patient with some patients uh, because they're scared to death. And they've lost trust. They failed at everything and they start to think it's themselves. Let your patient know it's not them. It's this crazy system that was very logical. What I found over the years is just because something's logical doesn't mean it has any basis in reality whatsoever. So that just because it's logical doesn't mean that it is going to help you. You have to start to learn to go with your instincts and your intuition. And that's what the myofascial therapist knows how to do, has been well trained to do, and will help you to start to tune into a more instinctive, intuitive side because it's fast and it'll never let you down. Logic, at least, you can lead anybody astray. Real, look what's happening in politics. I um, don't want to talk about that. But. <laughs> Well, speaking of, of, you know, logical versus intuition, why don't you go ahead and, and explain to everyone, especially those who are, have never heard this before, about channel three and channel five. How did that start? What does that mean? Okay. Um, it's very simplistic, but I think quite accurate. And our whole education was based on our intellect. And that's what I call channel five, our rational intellectual side. Our education really was mass hypnosis. And it's a big problem and it gets in our way because we're fed a lot of concepts that aren't in our best interest. So my fascia release helps us to finally think for ourselves. So all of healthcare is based on channel five and order and control. So what my fascia release does in a very natural, safe, highly efficient, highly effective way, is allow us to move into what I call channel three. Channel three is our intuitive, instinctive side. That's the healing zone. It's not about thinking about things. It's not trying making things happen. That's not what happens. Our mind body is capable of healing herself. And that's what we're tuning into here with the therapist help. And eventually you can do it on your own. So your intuitive, instinctive side is what I call our feeling intelligence. Neuroscientists have recently discovered that the database available to us in our feeling intelligence is in excess, excess of 10 million to one of that of our intellect. Right. So all education focused on this minuscule level of intellect. In other words, for all of that is wisdom. We are born with this incredible wisdom in us. We're all geniuses, but our schooling beat it, beat it out of us, especially if we were intuitive. I'm sure you all heard in school when you were younger, oh, it's only your intuition. Yeah, your most valuable faculty beat out of you. So it's our intuitive, instinctive side where we heal, which your therapist will help you get in touch with. Um, and that's what changes your life. It's not that our intellect isn't valuable, it's ex exceptionally valuable. But unfortunately, let me give you a couple other words for your channel five, your, your, it's your fearful side. It's your negative side, your judgmental side, critical side. How delightful is that, the way to live? You're living in fear. Most people in Channel 5 are living in an envelope of fear, riddled with performance anxiety. So Channel Thrive, Channel 3 is love. Love overcomes fear. Love is a power. I strongly believe that love is the energy that flows through the microtubules of the fascia system. And that's the good deal. I remember you saying that in the very first seminar that I that I went to, and I was so blown away by it, and it just made complete sense. And um, it, that really kind of leads into a story about unwinding. And I guess it's a good time to go there a little bit because that's you know at, when I was I had read this book, I had been using this book for about three years. 
I was super left brained because I was finishing my, my doctorate and, and being a PT at the same time and just, you know, research, research. And John, you and I have had this discussion about research and you just kind of roll your eyes at me <laughs> when I would talk about research when I first met you. And now I understand why, <laughs> because the channel three is kind of hard to research, right? But I had volunteered in MFR1 to do, to go up on the stage and be the demo for a diaphragm uh, transverse plane release. And he had just talked about channel three and channel five, like he just went through here. And so I, I got up there and put his hands there and he started to say, well, she's going into channel three and her eyes are going into nystagmus and which is this movement neurological pattern of the eyes. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I've got channel five going on at the same time going, oh, he's right, they are, they are doing this. And I, and her heart rate is increasing. And I could feel my heart rate just pounding. And I started sweating there on the table and I started to, I, there were these two dialogues going on. So this, you know, channel three, I was clearly going into and then channel five kind of assessing from a distance what was going on. And then I started to come up off the table. My back started to arch. I, I felt like my body would, was in the middle of one at the time I was, I had been previously, a, a runner and I, I was not feeling good enough to run for quite some time at this point, but um, from myofascial restriction. And I started to arch up, my back started to lift and I realized, wait a minute, I'm not doing that, but my body was doing that. And I got to a point and he's, you know, talking to the group saying, oh, she's going into channel three and he's encouraging me to stick with it. And then I got to a point where I was sitting up and I kind of freaked and I went right into channel five and he's like, okay, you're into channel five. Well, so since I kind of started with that, and it was at that moment when I really realized there was something more to this work that I wasn't doing just by following the manual and that I really needed this, this work. So John, in your words, why don't you share for you know, potential patients and for people who are patients now and, and for therapists, how you describe that myofascial unwinding experience, for example. Okay, so she's asking me to put the impossible into words. I know. <laughs> as best as you can. If anybody can. I'll do the can. best I can. Yeah. <laughs> and unwinding and all forms of myofascial release have to do with consciousness. So let me back up a little bit. You mentioned research too, then I'll come back into this part of the story that I didn't complete also about my initial unwinding. But all research basically asked itself a question. Does consciousness matter? So traditional research decided not because it was separate from the body, which it's not, but we were taught to discard the father of modern medicine and separated the mind from the body hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So that's a whole other story. We get into that later if we have time. But anyway, see what scientists don't look at is the meta paradigm, which is if consciousness doesn't matter, then all the theories that emanate from that are built upon that as if it was a reality. Uh, I have great respect for researchers that build computers, bridges, architecture, on and on and on, objects. But we're not an object. We're not a bunch of widgets to be stacked up and quantified. We have a consciousness, we cannot deny it. And unfortunately, by ignoring the consciousness, this is why most healthcare has been of temporary nature at best. So unwinding has to do with your consciousness. So how does that be, how is that elicited? It, it, it's elicited in an environment of trust of yourself and your therapist and guidance from your therapist. And eventually you can do a lot of it on your own. I go back to when I used to treat myself on my living room floor. So what I didn't tell you was there was one night, my back was really hurting bad and I was laying on my back I was laying on my belly and I put my hand back on my sacrum, which is the lower bone of your back. That's from my, my uh, surgery had been. And I started to move spontaneously. And the pain was building and it got it felt almost electric. And I was getting, getting scared I might injure myself. I was about to take my hand off when I heard my intuition say to me, wait until it releases. Now again, I had great trust in my intuition as most of us did when we were very young. But again, school kind of beat out our intuition. So but I listened to my intuition. And all of a sudden, I heard myself scream. And this lightning bolt of pain went through my body. And then I realized I wasn't in my body. I was up on the ceiling. 
looking down at my body or screaming. And then I collapsed on the floor and I was stunned, totally confused. And something shifted in me, in all parts of me that moment. And what I realized was my body had gone back into the position of where it fall over 300 pounds. So this is, we'll get into the positions in space, which is most in healthcare with trauma occurs. The subconscious has these positions in space indelibly imprinted in a mind-body complex. And it holds the memories of all that. So from that moment on, I felt so different. I can't, it's hard to even put into words. And from that moment on, my patients started to unwind spontaneously without me saying a damn word to them, you know. And their results took off like wildfire and they loved it. They begged for it. So unwinding is taking one's breaks off and allowing channel three, which is your subconscious, to express itself in motion. It turns out it's always trying to help you, but we've been so heavily programmed to be in channel five. It's like our breaks and it holds us down, keeps us rigid. Think about when you go to sleep at night and you go into the dream state, what happens? You move around, you thrash around, you drool, you dream, you cry. That's unwinding. You do it every night. There's really nothing esoteric about it whatsoever. The problem is if you fell out of a tree or got thrown off a horse, all sorts of things, you need a therapist to take out of gravity, find these positions of past trauma you can't do on your own. So you have to pay the damn therapist. <laughs> But you don't really need us forever, but you'll need us for a while. We'll do our very best to help you out. So there's something called positions of past trauma. Healthcare pays no attention to it because it pays no attention to the fact we have a mind. So when you're, let's say I'm walking across the street and I'm going, I, I'm, going I'm hit by a car. Bam, there's a position in space. We have the survival mechanism that pulls our feeling intelligence out of our body with this motion. We're injured in motion. I fall to the ground. There's another position in space. And the damn car rolls over. That's a big position in space. You know? Well, that's locked in your system. So it turns out we have the survival mechanism. It's actually amazing what happens. And every animal has it also. So when something's been too intense or too painful, our survival mechanism kicks in somehow, nobody really knows how, and pulls our feeling intelligence out of our body, not our intellect, but our feeling intelligence. The purpose is to numb you out, to help you get through the ordeal. It saves your life. So thank God we have it. But I found over years that nature wants us to learn from our experiences. So that if it's a fragmented experience, what you had to pull out from your body, it's the learning didn't occur. So now your subconscious is interpreting that it's an ongoing experience. You're being hit by the car day and night, day and night. You can't control it. And what happens when you're falling down the stairs, delivering a baby, being attacked, rolled, whatever, you're bracing constantly against that perceived trauma. It's this broken record that plays 10, 20, 30 years. And when the, somehow the subconscious, like therapists help you take gravity out, the therapist will never force you and it will never injure you. Your body will find these positions of past trauma. And when it does, you wait there. It's like suspended animation. The therapist will be holding you. And all the information, all the memories, all the sensations, pain and fear that are never fully felt at that moment come billowing through you, through the subconscious, connects with the conscious mind. And that's when your body starts to heal and you need to wait, hold, instead of holding like this all day long, being so anxious and depressed, everything starts to soften out, and that's what we call a release. So we have this magnificent mind, and this basically utilizes this. I look at my approach to myofascial release like a triad. So it's structural myofascial release, there's myofascial unwinding, and it's also something called myofascial rebounding. So they couple together. Most therapists will use all three of them as they move through you with you. Okay. Yeah, that was fantastic. And since we're we're here talking about these layers uh, that can happen over over decades, like you mentioned, you have at your treatment centers intensive programs. So can you talk a little bit about that and why that's important? And I I experienced this a lot as well, seeing someone who I know could really benefit from a lot of treatment upfront, and 
why is that better or important or different for them to know? Okay, so my recommendation for the therapist you're seeing now or will be seeing is it's better to get treatments more frequently up front and let your patients know it'll actually save them money in the long run. Because of these subconscious holding patterns that are locked in our body and they're very powerful and they really control us, whether you realize it or not, if you're not being seen often enough, they keep pulling you back into dysfunction. It's just not strong enough to overcome all the tightness that's been in your body. So the frequency with your local therapist is really helpful. But there are times when it'll help. So we, the intensive program is where you come to one of our treatment centers in Malvern, Pennsylvania, or Arizona Therapy on the Rocks in Sedona. We have a team of therapists there, and you'll be seen by a team of the best therapists around three times a day for two or three weeks. And it's not that you're not, therapist isn't great. You just need that intensity, you need that frequency that helps us break up the subconscious holding patterns that have been so powerfully controlling you. And then we, and when your local therapist now sees you'll be able to make better progress. So that's the whole purpose of that. So it's it's about kind of getting back to that system more frequently in the beginning so that it doesn't want to go back into that. Because I have people asking this, well, is this going to last? And, and of course we know that myofascial treatment is you know a lasting treatment. Sometimes there's sort of a two step forward, one step back, kind of a this push and pull. Um, how would you describe that for people to understand better? Yeah, well, the subconscious holding patterns are incredibly powerful. And as we all have them from our birth, actually, mm -hmm. it's funny thing, you're going to surprise some of the stuff that comes up, you thought you may have resolved. And then so that it's, it is a bank, it's like a roller coaster ride. And that comes back to uh, what you asked, what I say to patients too. I think it's really important to let your patients know early on that sometimes after treatment, you'll feel good. But sometimes you'll feel all stirred up mm. and it doesn't mean you're failing. Basically, this is taking you back in time to these subconscious holding patterns. And then when you leave the treatment room, you're not necessarily done. We've destabilized your system. There's another bad word in traditional healthcare. But as we destabilize the system, we go into chaos. Now your system starts to be able to be capable of self-healing. So when you go back to your home, uh, you may cry at night, you may vibrate, your body may start to unwind a little bit. So just to be, as long as you're in a safe place, don't hold it back, just let it go. Your mind body's been waiting a long time for this to come up for you. Right? Remember, it'll never injure you. So that uh, all that type of thing is totally different than what we learned in the past. And it's exactly what we all need. So um, the frequency is very, very important. And uh, the more, and then you can start to stretch it out. So it's, it's always going to be a zigzag. Human beings don't get better straight away. It's not what nature is. Back and forth, back and forth. And it's important you, the patient, do your own self-treatment. Your therapist will teach you how to treat yourself. Because you, they can't do it all for you. They're, they're giving you a lifetime skill to be responsible enough to take care of yourself and you deserve it. If you're not doing that, you need to sit down and have a talk with yourself. Do you not love yourself enough to take care of yourself? I know other things have let you down. This will not let you down. Just give it enough time, find a great therapist that you trust, and also have enough responsibility to also do your part of it. Thank you. That was my question to ask about self-care. So um, just what your recommendations are on that, if you could go into that a little bit. How often? Very cool. I'm sorry. Yeah. Every day? Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, because of my spinal, I am, my spinal fusion, I'm one of the people in the, unfortunately, I'm one of the people in the category of never get fully better. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I've had to treat myself every day. If I didn't, I wouldn't be functioning today. So um, it's no big deal. Make it a way of life. Don't, there's nothing you should dread at all. In fact, it makes you feel so much better when you do that. And teach your family how to do it. You can teach your family how to do that too. There's some very simple therapeutic tools that are very inexpensive you can use too. There's a little yellow ball and a blue ball a little bit bigger that you can put on your back and roll back and forth with it. You can't get back to yourself. Or you can stand against a wall. There's something called a cranial cradle, which is good for your neck and for headaches. There's wedges we use. 
uh, hurricanes. There's, there's a lot of different things that will help us to reach areas that can be our therapist for a while. So that your therapist will teach you how to treat yourself and help individualize your program. And after a while, don't dread it in any way. Start to look forward to it. If you miss a day, it's no big deal. But if you have a flare up, it's okay to take a couple of days off too. Mm -hmm. So it's em empowering patients to treat themselves. And it's, it, I think that alone can be very, quite a huge gift so that they're not just having to rely on someone else all the time. Right, right. right. So you mentioned uh, fibromyalgia. So uh, I didn't have that on my list initially, but since you brought it up and said maybe we could come back to it, I would love to hear what you have to say about fibromyalgia. I know there's a lot of people out there with that diagnosis. Yeah, when I was a young therapist, everything was sprains and arthritis. Now the buzzword is fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. So fibro, fibrous, that fascia system is fibrous tissue. Myo means muscle. Alja pain. So uh, let me broaden it out a little bit. Whatever diagnostic label you were given is just that a label. And the problem is it's talking about symptoms, effects. Mm -hmm. I know I'm prejudiced, but what I've seen over 50 years of treating people from all over the world, the primary problem that most of us have is fascia restrictions. And those fascia restrictions then create the symptoms that you and I have suffered with. Mm -hmm. So fibromyalgia, we treat patients from all the world with fibromyalgia. And unfortunately, too many times you're told they'll never get better. Or you know, the good, you know, the negative messages that too many patients get, we have to help them overcome them too. You are not fibromyalgia. You are not the label you were given. You're a human being and capable of helping yourself and we'll do the best we can to help you. So fibromyalgia, we, within uh, a couple, three, four weeks out here in Sedona, they're, they're climbing the mountains with us. So it's a matter of releasing the fascia. Obviously it can be very gentle because they're hurting really bad, but you're gentle with everybody. The therapist should be touching you super gently initially and they're waiting for your body to invite them in and you gradually increase pressure to meet resistance. You never violate resistance. You just nudge into it, stay with it, and go where the system takes you. You never lead when unwinding occurs. You go where their spontaneous motion goes because they know exactly where those positions in space are. If they get stuck, then we add a little bit of rebounding, in, which is an oscillatory motion that deals with the fluidity of our body. Can I bring up a little research since you brought it up before to the- Please. Okay. Uh, is a Dr. Alfred Feisinger from Germany who studied the fascial system for over 30 years. He has a new book out called The Extracellular Matrix Colon Ground Substance Regulation. You probably won't be interested in it because most research books are rather boring. <laughs> but I want to give you the important nuggets that were in there from 30 years of research. What Dr. Feisinger said is there is no nerve or blood vessel that touches any one of the cells of our body, which completely obliterates the whole theory of medicine and therapy. So it turns out that the environment of the cell is the ground substance, the fluid of the fascia. So the problem is you hear all these nutritional theories and all this and that. The reason the fascia is also very healthy for you because if you have fascia restrictions and the ground substance has solidified, no matter what you put in your mouth, it's not getting to the cells you're restricting. They're dying. So it doesn't matter what you eat and how good the nutrition may be when you put it in your mouth. That's not nutrition. It's when it gets to the cell, it can enter the cell that the true nutrition occurs. Mm -hmm. Hydration is not when you just swallow water. It's when it gets into the cell. There's an article I've written called Pouring Water on a Stone. And if you pour water on the stone, what happens? The surface gets wet, but it doesn't get in there. Mm -hmm. So if you can see my hands, think of the fascial system like a three-dimensional web, like a sieve. Now imagine you poured mud into the sieve. You can pour water now into the sieve. It's not gonna go through because the mud is blocking it. That's the equivalent of the fascial restriction. You're also blocking the oxygen every cell needs. The biochemistry, the hormones, the energy, the information, every cell desperately needs to thrive is being blocked. Your physiology is being thrown into total chaos. It's the most unhealthy thing in the world. Nobody's paying attention to it. 
You have to wake up. And healing is just that, awakening. You see, channel five, another word for channel five is in psychological parlance is called consensus consciousness, which is sort of level we're talking at right now. Another word for consensus consciousness is trance. You and I have been in a trance. We thought we were so bright. So healing is breaking out of that trance. And that's what my fascially says as therapists first and then allow you to do is wake up, to awaken. That's healing. That's why this is so important. And all the books in the world, all the self-help books, don't waste your money on these self-help books. They're telling you, oh, I feel good. I'm so happy. I'm so beautiful. And you're miserable inside. It's not until you get into these memories that were implanted in you early on from your education and parents and people who are well-meaning. You're walking around thinking you're stupid or you're bad or you're ugly, all sorts of things. You're not even aware of it. So without awareness, there's no choice. So as this awareness comes up from my fascia release, you can now change your belief systems and more positive and more loving for you. Wow. I'm so glad that everyone is able to hear these, these words from you that we hear over and again at, at your courses. And I just um, am reminded right now of a, of a question that actually a patient asked me. She knew I was going to be uh, talking to you. And, and she said, um, you know, ask him what it was like sharing his discoveries in the beginning when he was highly criticized and what helped you stay the course and what was your motivation and i just you know hearing you describe all these things and and knowing that you know we're just now in this day and age starting to get into some of this mind stuff and how it is affecting the body and with the, the new um talk of biotensegrity and, and you know finally medicine a tiny bit not really fully is coming along, but you're hearing it a little bit now. How did you stay the course in explaining all this with your knowledge back then? Well, first of all, your patient is I'm making the assumption that criticism has stopped. I'm being criticized as we speak, no. <laughs> and it's fine. I don't give a damn. <laughs> yeah, you know, way back when I first started, I couldn't talk to anybody about this because it just was, I mean, it was crazy from a traditional point of view. I understand that. I was, I'm very logical. I was brought up in the traditional whole thing, you know. But what I saw it did for patients, I could never give up. I don't care what anybody says about me. I know this was too important for healthcare and for patients and all the different healthcare professions. This is the missing link they all need to look into and, and utilize within their professional scope. So, um, I just, I just never, it's, I have sort of run the gauntlet, you know, you know, it's been a long road, but it's okay. It's okay. And it's, it's breaking out, as you said, uh, we're getting to the hundredth monkey theory and things are changing. It's going to change massively because it has to. Mm -hmm. it's, you know. That was actually yeah. one of the things I wanted to ask you if you felt like we were at the hundredth monkey area yet. And what, well, maybe, for, tell people what that is. Like, they, they might not know what that is, so. <laughs> we have time to talk about the hundredth monkey. Sure, it's it's not it's not an hour I'm yet. Not over okay. We have to be at the end of an hour. No, it's 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 not been an hour yet, so it's up to you. I know, but we're, okay. Well, I'll talk really fast. Right? Yeah. <laughs> There's a theory out there called the hundredth monkey theory. The story goes that there was a group of scientists studying a particular species of monkey on an island off of Japan. The island had physical characteristics where it had a mountain range that went down the middle that was so vertical that you could not get across. So they used to dig up these things to eat, let's say they were potatoes. And one day this monkey dropped her potato. It ran down a hill and landed in a creek and washed the mud off the potato. And she ate it that way and evidently liked it because from that point on, she would wash her potato. And her little brood would watch this behavior, so they started to wash their potatoes. Supposedly, when we got to the 99th monkey, when the 100th monkey washed her potato, everybody, well, not everybody, every monkey on the opposite side of the island started to wash their potatoes. Scientifically, it, it's, you might, might look into Rupert Sheldrake. He's an incredible scientist from Cambridge University in England. And he has a theory called morphic resonance, which is that. And it's when enough information has gotten into a particular species, there'll be a spontaneous shift where everybody gets it. 
And that's what's happening now with my FRS release. Uh, we're at the 98th, 99th monkey. Things are really shaking out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, when paradigms are shifting, there's tremendous turmoil. Mm -hmm. So those on the opposite ends of the polarity will just get thickly nasty. Mean, you know. um, a lot of turbulence right now. My FRS release teaches you, the human being, to be centered, to be calm and strong inside. And I guess that's what got me through all the criticism, too. Mm -hmm. So that as you get all this debris out of your system, all these antiquated, obsolete beliefs, you become very strong, you become very clear, you're all very capable of doing that. And as this turmoil continues, unfortunately, those stuck in a traditional paradigm are going through a hell, going to go through a hell of a big problems. I feel bad for it, and I don't feel good about that for them at all. But as you stick with your therapist and treat yourself, your mind will have great clarity, great depth. You'll have internal peace, calmness, and power. And that's our natural birthright. And that's what will help. This will help us all get to that point. Mm -hmm. Hang in there and enjoy your life. Can I have, do you have a couple more minutes? That's one of those things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We can go as long as you want, actually, John. <laughs> oh, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any questions though before i just well really the my last question that i had in here you know thinking of this this timeline was just what would you like us to know i would really want to leave it open to you to to just with your intuition your own intuition just tell us what else do you have for us today okay well going on with what i was saying first of all Medicine and surgery are very important at times when done appropriately, obviously. So I'm not in any way saying we shouldn't have medicine and surgery at times. But this will be the healthcare of the future. And yes, other therapists will use other forms of modalities and approaches, but my specialist would be the primary thing. And it should be done as soon as trauma is over, unless there's been massive trauma, fractures, and that type of thing, they're going to go see your doctor. You know, our critics, you know, they, they say stupid things like, well, if we're saying that if you have a fracture, you have to put lavender in your big toe. I mean, come on, cut the crap, you know? You obviously, you go to your doctor. But uh, this will be the healthcare of the future. But the human condition, unfortunately, has deteriorated. And most people I see, and I think most of my financial therapists I see, and most of us were this way, full of fear. And uh, we can't get out of it. It's just become a way of life and criticism, and negativity. And it's horrible. And it's the most unhealthy thing in the world because our mind does control our body and our health. So as you, I, I run into a lot of uh, wealthy people and they have all the toys, houses, cars, jewelry, boats. And as I'm treating them, I just feel this horrible sadness pouring out of them. And I'm reminded of an old song by Peggy Lee. That's it. That's all there was. See, the Channel 5 experience is empty. There's nothing wrong with having toys. But if you're not enjoying your life, what the hell's the purpose of it? We were brought up with a very dysfunctional message that we're here to suffer. And many of us have gotten really good at it. You're here to enjoy your life. Channel 3 is joy and love and wisdom. And we start to live in that space and you will be able to do that then you'll be able to have a very productive, happy, and healthy life. That's it. Beautiful. So that's a great way to end this. If there's no other thoughts from you right now, I just am so grateful to be able to have you here, um, hearing your voice and sharing it with people who haven't had the opportunity, like a lot of therapists have, to see you in person and experience your teachings and i will just say one thing this as i've been reading a lot of your interviews um lately and thinking about today coming up i i was really in, into one that you were i forget the person that you were talking to and it was all of these things and and the stuff that's coming up now that research is showing and and i thought wow this is just so great i went to look at the date of that interview and it was 1993. <laughs> <laughs> and you were talking about how they were they were you know finally showing this extracellular matrix matrix and it was from from that that long ago and i just 
want to thank you so much for staying the course and sharing this with so many people and hopefully this will get the word out there even more and really enjoy having you here and would love to do it again sometime if people have questions that that they want to um, ask of you if you're interested in that, especially as our times together have been much less because of the situation in the world right now. So, and we know that you enjoy seeing us as much as we enjoy seeing you. Thank you very much. It's really great being with you. It's really good to see you again. You did a great job. Cindy's a great therapist. So if you're in her area, go see her. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. I, I will put some I will put some links in this in this um, YouTube video that go to a lot of the things that John was talking about into his website to help guide you all. And the mfrtherapist.com will help you find people in your area as, as well. Thanks again, John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye.